hope and wonder. I think those are the biggest themes that I want people to come away with. How motivated are you to tell your story to the world? My guest this week is Stephen Gulich. He's an elementary school principal by day, but in the early morning hours before he goes to work, he's at the keyboard building worlds for his stories. So I reluctantly got up and I decided to, you know, start the day at 3.30 in the morning and by four o'clock I was on in front of the computer and man, I wrote some of the best work ever. Over the last 15 years, Stephen has crafted his debut novel, Piercing the Veil, a fantasy novel about the magic that has been lost to humanity. I was like, where, where did the magic go? And that was sort of the whole premise, where did the magic go? We talk about his book, as well as the path Steve took to get there, from early influences to his current literary inspiration. So this, the, the interviewer was saying, I was reading your book, and for a second there, I thought I was reading a Brandon Sanderson book. I forgot I was reading your book. I'm like, what? What a compliment. Whoa! This was an informative chat, especially so if you're one who's taken a bit more time in crafting your first novel. Or maybe you've yet to start it and are looking for practical ways to make the time to do so. Sit back and get ready to pierce the veil with us. Welcome to the greatest podcast in the multiverse, where each week I talk to science fiction and fantasy authors about myth, magic, and the infinite possibilities of storytelling. Ready to explore? Because on this show, every conversation is a doorway into a different world. So welcome once again to the greatest podcast in the multiverse. I'm very excited to have a very special guest with me today. Welcome here, Stephen Guglitch. Thanks, Herman. I am happy to be here. So excited. Uh, I, I love a fantasy and sci-fi, and I'm always happy to to talk to a fellow nerd about it. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm I'm really glad to have you here. And uh, I've I've listened to. I was telling you uh, before we hit record here. I listened to your interview with uh, with Daniel uh, Kulba on the uh, yeah. fantasy and sci-fi fanatics that podcast. We had fun. <laughs> yeah, it was a good interview too. So, um, but I'd like you to just uh, I guess get us started started and tell our listeners a little bit about yourself and how you got started in writing. Okay. Well, as Herman said, my name is Stephen Guglich. Uh, I go by Steve casually. Uh, but uh, so I am, I've been a lifelong fan of fantasy and sci-fi. My dad was a big fantasy and sci-fi fan. Um, so he kind of raised us on it, uh, you know, and uh, I guess he, he was my first muse, I would say. He inspired my imagination and, you know, where everybody, you know, I, I, where everybody else was, was, pretending to be other characters from stories. I always, I, for some reason, I always wanted to make up my own and insert my own character in in the Star Wars universe or in the He-Man universe or something like that. Yeah, right. Were pretending as kids. So I've always had a pretty wild imagination. And cool. uh, so when I'm not writing, I'm a, I'm a full-time uh, elementary school principal. And uh, I have four amazing kids and a, an amazing wife who I would consider my my muse nowadays, uh, you know, she's not as big of a fan of science, science fiction, fantasy as, as I am, but she loves my writing well, and nice. encourages me to write as much as I can. So wonderful, wonderful, and you and you try, right? <laughs> you're, yeah. you're, try, you're trying to get her on board. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> she it. she uh, she hadn't read any fantasy and sci-fi before until she read my book. So she she tells all her friends how much she enjoyed it and, and she calls it a gateway, uh, a, a gateway to fantasy. Wonderful. That's awesome. Yeah. That's great to yeah. hear. So, you know, um, like I'm interested to know, like what were some of your early, what were some of those early influences that brought you in? You mentioned star Wars. Was that kind of the main, the main, uh, I watch? would say star Wars was the catalyst. You know, okay. I remember going to see star Wars for the first time in 1977 on the big screen. I was six years old. My dad took me, um, and, you know, before that, it was all that stop motion and mm -hmm. stuff. And, it, you know, it looked kind of hokey and whatnot. But, I mean, I, of course, back then, we didn't think it was hokey. We thought it was cool. Oh, yeah. And then all of a sudden, Star Wars comes out, and it's this completely different way of do, doing special effects and immersing you in, in, in the universe. And and that's, you know, that I think that was the big the big catalyst. I'll never forget that. You know, people ask me what my favorite movie is, and... And I, I'd have to say Star Wars, not not just because of the story, but also because of the experience that I, I, I had to enjoy. I got to enjoy right. that with my dad. Yeah, right. That's cool. That's really cool. I like to hear that. And so you, um, but you're a fantasy writer. So how did, when was your, what was your kind of your entryway into fantasy? The fantasy oh, world? well, I mean, fantasy and sci-fi, they go, they hand, go hand in hand. hand. They really they're, do. Yeah. It's just, you know, it's, it's just 
one one end of the same spectrum i would say it would mm -hmm. say but um so my first i i guess my first foray into fantasy probably would have been the hobbit and um i also remember my dad's bookshelves and and looking at some of the books that he had like dragon riders of pern and mm -hmm. um some some others um and he always had this frank frazetta fantasy calendar in his uh workshop that okay. was always up there and you know he would get it the new one every year cool. and the artwork was you know frazetta is just amazing uh with the artwork so you know there was that and then um and then i had some friends when i was 10 years old introduced me to D D, and i played a wizard uh for the first time and, cool. and just fell in love with that and ran home to tell my dad about it and, and right. uh, told him how much I wanted the, the, the basic set. And I, I, he was, he got it for me for Christmas that year. And then Very he, cool. he was my first dungeon master, real dungeon master after my friends. And he would kind of take my friends and I on all these, these adventures, uh, that, that he, he created. Uh, that's really cool. So that was, yeah, it was, it was awesome. Yeah. That's, that's really a, a great entryway and a great experience and great memories for you to, you know, bring into, into your writing and into, you know, part of your experience. I love that. For sure. Yeah. yeah. So when was it that you first decided to um, pick up the keyboard yourself and, and start your writing, <laughs> your writing journey? Well, um, you know, like I said, my imagination was always there, but my, uh, my confidence in my own skills was not. Um, so it really wasn't until I got into high school uh, where I, I actually hadn't even been a, an avid reader until I got into high school. And I had this this teacher, Mrs. Houtman, and she kind of inspired not only the love of reading, but also uh, writing as well. She challenged us. She gave us an assignment where we had to do a, a book report in ninth grade, where we had to we had to have a book. It didn't matter what book it was, as long as it was 200 pages. And when I heard 200 pages, I'm like, no, <laughs> I can't read a book that's 200 pages. So I'm agonizing over this. And uh, I remember sitting in the school library and I saw um, Piers Anthony's uh, uh, Spell for Chameleon, the first Anth book on the shelf. And uh, I judged a book by its cover, even though we were, I was told not to. <laughs> and, uh, so I picked it up. And really, that's when I really enjoyed that. Cool. Um, and then the same teacher also, um, I wanted to, I used to like to draw. So I wanted to make a comic strip for the school newspaper. Um, but she saw something more in me and she kind of, um, after my first year, oh, we had, he actually was one of the editors. The art editor was sick and I needed, she needed somebody to write an article okay. on an art exhibit or something. I don't even remember what it was at school. And so she uh, she had me do that, and then I became the art editor editor of the paper, and then I became the the editor in chief for the last three years. Of the, uh, and you know, so she she was definitely the my inspiration for for becoming a writer and 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 just having the confidence. Mm -hmm. um, and then you know, so I would dabble, but then when I was married um, or was courting my wife, actually she sort of inspired that uh, that love of writing in me and i because i used to leave her little notes every morning uh, little inspirations uh, i used to call them call them words of encouragement or woes mm -hmm. daily woes mm -hmm. and they were just little you know a couple of paragraphs about having you know uh, usually based on bible verses and um on our wedding night she actually gave me a book with all of my woes oh, that i had written cute. her <clears throat> over the years and uh, and published them and she told me she said you need to be a writer oh that's wonderful and that was it and then you know and so then i just had a fine time to write and i, I did so and very that's cool what, that's that's how the first book came about <laughs> that's wonderful now yeah. so so was, uh, piercing the veil that is that your first published work that is the first book i've published yes. okay yeah. were there were there other books that you had written and are in a drawer somewhere uh, there are short stories, half of stories, uh, ideas all over the place. Um, you know, lots of uh, role playing adventures for my friends and family and kids and and, and whatnot. But uh, Piercing the Veil was the first book that I actually put into novel form. Okay, and um, the first and, story I put in. And the if novel. I remember correctly, like it took you a while to get that novel to completion. Is that? Is that right? Yeah, because I'm also a world building nerd too. I just <laughs> love world building. I so uh, and I that I guess that comes from my role playing background. But I so I would consider myself a deep world builder. So I took a lot of time to um, 
to invest in the background of the world. You know, mm -hmm. I created uh, cultures and and biographies and all that, and okay. then started to finally put it together. Yeah, and it was. I, I would say I've been working on Pierce. I worked on Pierce in the Vale for probably fifteen years, just wow. okay. here and there. And then it was really the last four years before it was published that I was able to get into it, really get into the meat of the story and start taking it seriously as right. the story, not necessarily the, you know, the world building. And uh, after all that was done uh, okay, and finding okay. the time um, to write, that was, yeah. that's always been the big thing, you know, like all, all of us uh, part-time writers, we would love to be full-time writers, but it's just right now it's not in the cards. So I, right. I have to find the time to, to do that. Yeah. So uh, a few strings, a few, threads I want to tug out there a little bit. Um, first, let's talk about the, the process of, of putting the story together, because I mean, you said you took, um, it took you 15 years. Um, how did the story look like at the beginning of that process versus how it ended up published? Like, um... <laughs> I remember being so excited about the first couple of chapters and, you know, and just looking at them and then going back now compared to see what the first chapter was to the then and what it is now. I mean, it's like a child wrote the first chapter the first mm -hmm. time. But uh, so I learned I learned the lesson that, you know, that really that first draft is for you um, right. when you're writing. And uh, uh, I had to get out of that comfort zone of, of, of trying to make my first draft the, my polished draft. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I learned that um, the real fun really comes after you get that first draft and then you go back. I'm one of those guys. Uh, I, I don't mind editing. I actually love the editing process because mm -hmm. that's when I start to insert layers and I can tie chapter 19 back to chapter one and, and, and I oh, agree. I do this and I got to do that. And I, 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 it's like building with Legos, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I agree with that. I, I really actually love the first round of editing. It's like the fifth round of editing that I'm done. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> You're right. You're right. It, it, it can get tedious after a while. Yeah. Yes. I know you're like, uh, I'm ready to get this thing printed. And that was my wife too. It was just like, okay, you're done. You need your, this is the fifth draft. You need, this is it. You need to publish it. Uh, That's so. great. Yeah. Cool. And then I guess the second question I have from, um, from all that too was, um, so you're uh, a teacher, you're a principal, um, yes. and you have a family. Um, how do you find the time to write? Well, that's a, that's a fun story. I love telling the story because yeah, I, for years I agonized over trying to find the time to write. And uh, my wife was always trying to encourage me. So I get home, you know, uh, we'd have dinner, spend a little time with the kids, tuck the kids into bed. And then I would try to sit there in front of a computer with bloodshot eyes, just trying to come up with an idea and I'm like, I got to write at least one paragraph, one paragraph tonight. And it just, you know, it wasn't, uh, that was my first challenge to get one paragraph a day done. Yeah, right. <laughs> At yeah. least that was the minimum. Um, uh, and then my wife and I, we finally decided, you know, I, I need to pray about this. I need, I need to, to go to God and ask him, okay, God, I, I have this passion to write. I really need to be able to find the time to do that. Can, you know, and, and we just prayed about it. So that, that next morning I, uh, found myself walking, waking up at three 30 in the morning. And I'm tossing and turning and, and like an idiot, I lay there till six o'clock in the morning, tossing and turning, waiting for the alarm to go off to, to <laughs> go to work. Um, and this happened for three days in a row. I'm just tossing and turning. And finally I like, oh, wait a minute. This could be the answer to prayer. I don't know. I, I, <laughs> this could be, you know, so I reluctantly got up and I decided to, you know, start the day at three 30 in the morning. And by four o'clock I was on in front of the computer and man, I wrote some of the best work ever because the house was so quiet. Yeah, there was yeah. no one around, nothing in the background. It was just me, the keyboard and my music. And it was amazing. And so I started to make that my habit. And that's how I get most of my writing done. I mean, there are times, other times, you know, during the day or, you know, uh, I like, Rarely do I get a lunch break because there's always so much going on at school. But every now and right. then, I, if I can, if I can muster up a, a lunch break, um, I, I might do some writing then or on the weekends, take some extra time. Or if the kids are at a birthday party or something like that, mm -hmm. um, I, you know, I, I get some extra time to write. But yeah, that that four o'clock, four to six, it's just it's amazing. It's just so 
um, I, I can't even describe it. It's just, it's just such an inspiring time. So yeah, right. Yeah, that's I, how uh, Pierce and the Veil was written. <laughs> very cool. I agree with you. I mean, I get up. Um, I often haven't been doing this as much lately, but I when I get my best writing done, it's I'm up at five. I'm writing between five and seven that window before I have to go to work, and I get one or two thousand words in and. And then you're then you're also not thinking about it for the rest of the day, right? You're That's not right. Wondering when yes. you're going to get your words in, right? So um, <laughs> I do find it great. Yeah, because I was running into the same um, struggle as you, actually. Like I would get home from work, I'd be way too tired to try to get words down because I work at, at a desktop as well. Like I, I'm a web designer, so I'm sitting at the computer all day. So by the time I got home, my eyes were going buggy. I've been staring at the screen all day. It was really tough to get your mind, you know, shifted into that process. So Getting the words yeah. down first, I found was way easier. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. So I, I'm interested, uh, Steve. You know, so you're you're taking the time. You've been working on this, uh, getting up early to get these words out. What's your What's the motivation behind your storytelling? Why did you need to get this story out? I, I think it was just instilled in me. You know, since I was a kid, just the idea of of, of storytelling, being creative. I I am a creative person. I love to I love to cook, and that's like, so I get my creativity out there as well. Mm -hmm. um, in you know, as a principal, I do all these crazy things, just you know, that are that are just part of my nature of being of being a, a creative person. And um, storytelling is is just what, really one of my favorite things to do. And uh, so that that was it was it was in there. It just it, it, and it had to come out. Uh, right. Is the best way to describe it. Um, and when it did come out, it was like, oh, this is this is this is good stuff. I'm, you know, I, 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 um, I gotta pat myself on the back, you know, type, <laughs> type stuff. I'm, re I'm really liking how the story's coming along. And, um, so that, that was, that was the outlet. And like I said, my wife's encouragement, you know, cause I, I don't think I had the confidence even after Ms. Houtman had made me the editor in chief of the, the, the cherry tree newspaper back in high school. Um, mm -hmm. even after that, you know, I, I still didn't have the confidence to, to think, you know, me, I, how could I be a, a novelist type? Right. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. A, no a novel is definitely a different um, challenge. It's a really an intimidating challenge to look at the, the scope of a novel, the length of a novel and think, how am I going to write, you know, right. 300, yeah. 400, 500 words, right. Or pages, sorry. And, and put that yeah. out there. Um, yeah. I, I definitely understand that. That's, <clears throat> I mean, that's why it took me so long to, to write a novel myself because it, uh, yeah, it was just that intimidation of, of the length of it. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It yeah, is definitely cool. intimidating. <laughs> <laughs> so why don't you tell us a little bit about that, the novel that you have out now, Piercing the Veil. Uh, tell us what it's all about. So Piercing the Veil is the first book in the Veil saga. And I came up with the idea after thinking about mythology and all these legends from all across the world. You know, there's, there's all these amazing stories of magic and fantastic creatures and heroes of, of myth and legend. And we really don't have them anymore. I mean, sure, we read the old ones, but as far as new ones coming along, you know, so I was like, where, where did the magic go? And that was sort of the whole premise. Where did the magic go? Okay. It was there <laughs> thousands <laughs> of years ago. Where is it now? Right. And so I came up with the idea of the veil. Um, I, don't, I don't like to give away too many spoilers um, in, yeah, in the story. But, um, so I came up with the idea of the veil that there was a, a period in history in which those who were enchanted decided that the humans were just getting out of control, too big for their britches type thing. They weren't listening. They didn't want to be a, a part of the solution. And they figured these these enchanted beings decided, well, we're just going to let them kill themselves off and, uh, and we're going to hide behind this veil until, until it's over. And then we'll, we'll, we'll just, we'll come out. And, um, so that's been going on for uh, almost two millennia, um, or three millennia, I should say. Um, and in between that time, there have been those beings passing through the veil, uh, coming to, um, you know, in, into the human territories and interacting and in, in sporadically and that's where some of those myths and legends come from i had one reviewer say that uh, she really enjoyed the book because it gave origin stories to the myths and legends that she she knew uh you know she grew up with cool 
Cool, very cool. Now, how did like how did um, how did you get the idea for this story? I know that's a tough question to answer, especially. Well, there's and, one, and again, I don't want, I don't like to give away too spo- too many spoilers, but there's one myth, one particular myth and legend that I I focused on in the first book. Okay. Um, and that was sort of I wanted to take that idea and and just do as the reviewer said, give an origin story that was mm-hmm. realistic, and that was important to me. I really wanted. Uh, the Vale saga to to be realistic that when a, a person picked it up they're like whoa this this could be real this could be true and uh, mm-hmm. so I did a lot of um, not only you know fantasy but I did a lot of historical fiction I used historical people okay. I used historical events and I wove the story in, into those in, into those and, and um, that was sort of the idea that branched out from there that one particular myth um, okay. and legend. Yeah, um, that's really cool. Yeah, yeah so, it was fun. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I love that. So you know, so you've worked in um, the historic, like a bit piece, pieces of history, pieces of myth and legend. How do you keep track of it all? Do you have a world bible that you use? What? Do you, oh yeah. How do you keep track of everything? Oh, I have I have files gig uh, gigabytes long that are just <laughs> you know like, with the world building. So yeah, I just I have a whole file that's dedicated to the Vale Saga. And in those files on my computer are all, uh, you know, different. There's a folder for history. There's a folder for each, each of the races. There's a, f- uh, a timeline. Um, you know, one of these days I'm going to actually get to print out the timeline and put it on my wall in my office here. But um, I haven't done that yet because the timeline keeps changing right. <laughs> so, <laughs> or advancing, I should say, as I write, uh, as I get into book two now and, and finish book one. Um so, but I still think I need to do that. I think that would help me with some of the, uh, yeah, I had to keep track of the events because like I said, it's all based on our world. I mean, the, the veil, the enchanted people, they don't live in another realm or anything. They're just hidden. And one of the things that the veil does is it um, not only hides, but it also creates uh, a, a feeling of, um, nervousness if, if you you as a you someone who's unenchanted were to approach the veil you'd like you'd you feel apprehensive and you'd turn around you know so okay. um that's kind of the idea there so that you know that's how i'm because I, I wanted the cities to be believe how could there be an elven city in the middle of the forest in germany and nobody's found it you know that right. type of thing so there had to be a way around that so i i came up with you know it's not just invisible it creates this this feeling of um fear uh and and the closer you get the worse that fear becomes and you're just you're you're done you got to run away from it that's really cool i like i really like that idea now um i guess um on your world building a little bit just one more question like so your folders and files like are you just using word documents is that how you're sorting yeah yeah Yeah, word documents and then it's all backed up on google drive so i have i have it set up at that as as i write it it backs up automatically to to google drive and then and then every now and then I'll back it up to a, a, a um, an external hard drive to make sure I okay. don't lose anything. Yeah, that's that's smart. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't want to do that. No, um, especially no. not when you have that many years of work invested into uh, it, this world building. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thankfully, um, I'm not one of those writers who have lost any of my stuff. I, I, I I'm so meticulous when it keeps trying to keep track of it all and back it up. And you know, I even used to have a little hard drive a little external hard drive or a thumb drive that i used to carry around that would keep the most recent stuff on it but oh, really? now with with the way google has uh google drive sets it up it's it's really wonderful i mean it's it's nice yeah, for sure you can access it from anywhere now right yep, yep. yeah yeah that's cool um can you tell me like so is the story um is it single point of view do you have multi multi point of views so there are there are multiple points of view. It's it's considered epic fantasy. So that you have we have multiple characters. There are two main characters. There's an ordinary guy named Jeremy, and uh, he's, I guess, loosely based on myself and some of my friends. Uh, I kind of made a conglomeration of, of 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 my friends when we were younger. Um, so he's just this uh, uh, fourth grade teacher who um, gets roped into the the mystery behind the. The veil, and again, without giving away any spoilers, you know he he gets uh, he gets thrust into that. And then there's another character named Masaru, who's on the other side of the world, and they are, and he is um, also um, 
he lives in Japan and he, he was raised, he was adopted and raised by, um, by an American family who has, who works in Japan. And he is, uh, always been guided by some, by this mysterious voice that is always leading him and guiding him. And, uh, and he, uh, is trying to figure out what's going on there as well as he gets older, because it's, you know, not everybody has a voice that tells them what to do. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, I guess without um, giving away, obviously, any spoilers, like, can you tell us a, a little bit more about their, you know, what leads them to the, you know, the point of what they need to do at that point? I could try. As you yeah. can tell, yeah. I'm a real stickler <laughs> for spoilers. <laughs> I know. That's fine. I I'm... have spoiler alerts on everything. I'd always, if yeah. my kids see a movie before I do, I'm like, don't tell me about it. I don't want to hear it. I want to, right. you know, <laughs> or if anybody sees a movie before, I don't, I don't, I don't want to talk about it until I see it. Um, yeah, I but, agree. um, yes, there is, um, in, for Jeremy, um, he meets someone from the other side of the veil who, um, who presents him with an opportunity. And for Masaru, he's led by this voice again. Um, and that leads him to the other side of the veil for a specific reason. And they both, they both have very specific reasons for, for their adventure. And then, um, so those, you know, again, like I said, without giving away too much, um, for those two guys. And then there's a couple of uh, other, other minor POVs that I stick in there that just, to, just to kind of, spice it up a little bit you know yeah um, i try not to go too crazy with povs i'm actually having that issue right now with book two i'm like oh this would be good from this person's pov but i don't want to you know i don't want to go overboard and have all these too many characters because right. i've read i've read i've read epic fantasy where there's lots of characters that i really mm -hmm. like you know that are good like the stormlight archives by brandon sanderson uh, you know, I like how he wove all the different characters in. And then I've read mm -hmm. other books and I don't want to name the authors and books, by, but um, where I'm like, oh, there's, there's just too many characters in this and too much going on. And if I have yeah. to stop reading and go on to the Wikipedia to figure out who's doing what and why, and, and it's like, it's not worth it for me. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So that, that's my challenge is to try to keep, try to be more like Brandon Sanderson and less like some of the other yeah. ones that I've read that are just, you know, I don't want people to have to jump out of the book and go and go on the Wikipedia site and find gotcha. out what's going on there. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's a good segue into, um, into the next question though. Um, who are some of your inspirations of other authors in this, for this series? Like who, who do you typically read who kind of inspires you as an author? Well, well, growing up, there was Piers Anthony, F. Yeah. Paul Wilson were some of my, uh, some of my big inspirations back then. Um, uh, but most recently, I would say within the last 20 years, it's been Brandon Sanderson. I mean, he kind of just really took the bar uh, and, and raised it, especially with the Stormlight Archives. That it, that to me was just an, it's such an incredible series, what he what he did, especially the first book, The Way of Kings is, is my I know a lot of people, their favorite book in the series is the second book. But I, I just I The Way of Kings was just just blew me away and and challenged me as a writer that this is what I, uh, what I want to do, um, you know, and, and what I want to be able to accomplish. And what was really cool is I was doing another interview for a podcast uh, last year when the book first came out and I got the coolest compliment ever. It was so cool. So this, the, the interviewer was saying, I was reading your book and I'm, and I'm three chapters in and for a second there, I thought I was reading a Brandon Sanderson book. I forgot I was reading your book. And I'm like, what? Awesome. what a compliment whoa <laughs> I, that i mean man I, I i i couldn't stop talking about that yeah so that was really awesome. cool that was no it, so i i was really i was pleasantly surprised by that yeah yeah you've got to use that as you know the poll quotes on your amazon page and, and all yeah. that <laughs> i should i need to do that yes yeah, yeah. that's because that's a great quote and what a great compliment like that's uh that's incredible yep. i love that i love that so um, I guess um, let's talk about your magic system. What is what does the magic system in your story look like? So yeah, I was super excited when I first created the magic system because obviously there had to be magic. But I, and I had that other parameter that I put in place for myself was I wanted it to be realistic. Um, so I started doing research, and I used to also be a science teacher before I became a principal. Um, so I kind of grounded it in science and it's based on the idea of zero point energy. I don't know if you're familiar with that concept. And, you know, so there's the, but, you know, uh, there's why don't you, for our listeners, why don't you just tell us, uh, tell 
Yeah, so in a head. nutshell, yeah, yeah. there's this energy that's out there that scientists believe is out there um, that's completely untapped, that, that you know, we, we haven't been able to harness it yet. You know, the, the, the idea of the, um, uh, what are they, there's an engine, I forget the name of it, but there was a, a, a Tesla had come up with the idea of this um, singularity engine where, you know, where it's, it's just free energy uh, because it's all out there. Yeah. Um, and so I kind of capitalized on that concept of the zero point energy being everywhere. And um, I used that as my magic system. I took, nice. I said, so I broke down uh, the beings or the uh, creatures and, and uh, life in, in the Vale Saga into two categories. There are biomagical and bioelectrical creatures, uh, beings. Mm -hmm. Humans are bioelectrical. We we are able to harness energy and use it, and that's how our bodies run. Where so elves would be biomagical. They are, are so they are able to tap into that zero point energy, that magic that's there, and and they cool. become conduits of it. So nice. that's why humans are not able to use magic, uh, but elves and dwarves and gnomes and other creatures are, are able to, um, to tap into that. And mm -hmm. so there's that abundant source of energy, but then I, I also had to limit it too, so that the elves weren't all powerful. So, you know, their body can only handle so much, uh, right. at a time they can only okay. take, you know, otherwise they get, they get overworked and, um, you know, and they have to take a rest before they, they can do that. So they're, they're able to just harness the energy that's all around them. Uh, and that was oh. kind of the basis for that. So, you know, as I'm creating all these different spells for lack of a better term, um, and uses for the energy, I, um, or for, for the magic, what the elves call magic, what we would call zero point energy. Um, I had to come up with parameters on how they used it and what they used it for. And so there, if you follow the elf, the elven society or the, the dwarven society and the gnomes and, a lot, everything they have is based on zero point energy, their, their technology there. That was the other fun thing that was uh, awesome about the world building is I had to imagine, okay, what were elves like 3000 years ago? And then how would they evolved into a modern society with technology right. and, and, and all based on, on magic and not electricity. Yeah, yeah, because you've created this um, magical world that's been locked away for three thousand years. So you kind of yeah. have to and, think, but they've you know, still evolved. Be, yeah, right. Yeah. We're not the same as we were three thousand years ago. Exactly. So, uh, you know, yep. how are they going to change? Yeah, I really like that idea. Yeah. Yeah. So, the, so that's 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 the magic system in a nutshell. <laughs> yeah. Okay. No, I really I really love that. So, um, you know, so you mentioned you're working on book two. Um, yep. Obviously, that has not taken you thirteen years to. No, no, Can thankfully, so? <laughs> yeah. I'm about halfway through and it's taken me, let's see, Pierce and the Veil came out in April of 23. So yeah, so I'm, you know, it's taken me about a year to, to write half the novel right now. Okay. So. Yeah. So, you're, so I'm hoping you're... one more year and then it'll, and then I'll, I'll be ready to go for the next one. Very cool. So yeah, so you're you're approaching it at a pretty good pace then, you know, compared I think to so. the first book. Um, yeah. You know, now how do you find the process of writing this one different than writing the first one? Um, well, I, you know, I, 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 with one book under my belt, you know, it's it, it, of course it's a lot simpler, uh, simpler in the sense that I know. I know where I'm going. You know, I always have the end in mind. Anyway, I'm I'm a pantser. Uh, I'm a pantser writer or discovery writer, but I always have the end in mind. I know how the story is going to end. Um, so I have to get to the end, but I know now I have a process in place. You know, I'll get the first draft done, and then I'll go back and work on the second draft. And it, whereas when I was writing book one, I was trying to I was figuring out the process along the way. You know, I kept on sending stuff to my editor before I really even needed to. Uh, you know, so I'm just going to wait till draft one is, is done before I, I have my critique partner and my editor uh, look at it. And, uh, and so I think that's where it's a little bit more streamlined. I, I get the process better. <laughs> yeah. Like, and do you feel um, like more, I don't want to say like, do, like how does it feel for you having had that novel completed? Is it easier knowing that you're going to be able to finish this novel than it was the first one? 
Oh yes, for sure. Yeah, yeah. It's it's like yeah, I've done this already. I could do it again. Yes. <laughs> yeah, <that's laughs> yeah. Great. I mean, the excitement is still there. I still love the writing. I'm still looking forward to 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 launching the book. Um, I intend to do a Kickstarter like I did for the first one. I intend to do a Kickstarter for the second one, and right. that's a big difference too in in writing the second book as part of the Kickstarter for the first one was there were some higher tiers in the Kickstarter where you could purchase the book, but you could also purchase a character that would uh, appear in the second book. So that was oh, a cool. little bit challenging. So I had to, I had to work with the, the five people who bought those tiers and create okay. characters. Um, that's cool. And, and inter interweave them into the story. So that's been uh, a little bit different. So I'll probably do that for the second one uh, for the second Kickstarter as well, because it's, okay. it's been a fun concept. Yeah, that's a really cool idea. So now, like, so they're involved in creating the character. Or are they just naming the character? How does that? No, they create. I so I sent them a, a Google form with questions about their character. Okay. And uh, just you know, so they got to name the character. They got to pick the the species or the race that the character is. They got to, you know, talk about their quirks, their their desires, all that stuff, and then cool. uh, and then we kind of went back and forth, you know. Uh, I kind of let him gave him a lot of free reign at first, and then I had to kind of <laughs> rein them in a little bit <laughs> to, 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 to rein them in a little bit because um, whether they fully understood the the world building you know, or not. Like um, in in the book, um, half elves are uh, so like if you were to if a human and an elf were to were to have a child, uh, the, there's been no recorded. Um, history that where the human mother has ever survived childbirth. Well, okay. the, the draw, the pull of the magic as the, as the child is, is um, being born is just too, too much of a strain. Mm -hmm. um, so I had a one character, one person who wanted to create a half elf, but they wanted the mother involved in, in the story. And, you know, we had to sort of talk about uh, the mother, you know, the mother, can't be involved and i'm not ready to come up with a a, a caveat to that uh, that ability you know or that right that, that circumstance so yeah yeah so that it was just it was fun it was it was really really cool to, mm -hmm. to be able to do that yeah cool now like and i'm interested too like so this was your your first book what made you decide to go the kickstarter route with it uh, my my narrator who who did the audiobook he really okay. convinced me you know so i i when i I knew that I wanted to do an audiobook. I wanted to have a simultaneous release of the ebook, the paperback, the hardback, and mm -hmm. the and then um, the audiobook all at the same time. Um, so we saved our money and we made sure that we had you know, we were able to do that. And plus, we did the kicks and the, and he was uh, he was very. He said just just do a Kickstarter. It it it, it couldn't hurt. You know it it, it right. really. You know you never you know so if if it doesn't. If it doesn't take off, then it doesn't take off. If it does, um, and it was amazing. It was super successful. It was a lot of fun to put together. Awesome. Uh, and you know that was one of the the way we approached the Kickstarter was um, my wife and I. We just we did it as a presale. So like if you order the okay. book, you got these presale perks. So you're you're right. And instead of uh, you know, like, a, a, we didn't do it like a fundraiser. We did it, you know, that you, you do it now, you'll get the book plus some you additional. Really, yeah. yeah um, cool. And that worked really success. We were funded and we were fully funded within 20 minutes. And that, oh, wow. Yeah. Congratulations. That's yeah, amazing. it was cool. It was funny, though, because I should have taken the day off of work. I didn't, you know, cause <laughs> we launched on a Tuesday. And, um, you know, I went to work thinking, okay, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens, you know, and I'll, I'll check later on. Um, and as I'm, I'm I'm at school, you know, walking around, going to classrooms and whatnot, I and then I go to take a little break in my office around eleven thirty, and there's all these texts from my wife on on my phone. Are, are you, have you been watching this? Have you seen what's going on? Are you? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, no, I didn't expect. You know, I figured I figured it'd be a few days. You know, right, I, I yeah. figured, but it was. It was so cool. It was really that's phenomenal. Uh, like, to be fully funded in, in, in twenty minutes was was amazing. So yeah. yeah. Well, congratulations. That's a, yeah. That's thank really you. Exciting. Yeah. It was. Yeah. It was. Yeah. That's awesome. Cool. So, not, like, how many books do you have planned for the series? Well, I got lots of ideas. Like I said, yeah. so the <laughs> the the, uh, the outline or the very loose outline, because like I said, I'm a discovery writer, but I have mm -hmm. I have the idea for for the first three books in the initial trilogy. Then I have 
a fourth book, which is going to be, a, which I'm calling a bridge book. It's going to bridge the first series with the second series. Okay. Uh, and then, so, and then I have lots of ideas for the second series as well. So, um, but I'm really looking forward to getting to the bridge book because the bridge book takes a big turn uh, in the, in the unit, you know, for the world, uh, for the universe, actually. And to, right. To, so I, I'm really excited about doing that. So, yeah. Once book two is done, I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll finish book three and then get started on book four. I actually have already started book, book four. I, I decided that while the Kickstarter was running, um, I would do Nano Remo because I launched in November. Okay. So I figured, yeah. you know, I'll take a little break. I, I thought I mean, yeah. maybe I'll do book two for Nano Remo, but I just wanted to get the idea for book four out, and I, right. I, I was able to to write the fifty thousand words for the for at least the first book. So that's sitting there in draft in in, in very loose draft form. Cool, so, very yeah. cool. No, that's yeah. that's great, and that's a great idea to take a bit of a break in between books and write something a bit different. That's yes. I kind of did that with my last book as well. So. I um, just have to be careful that that doesn't turn into its own, <laughs> yeah. its own project, right? <laughs> distract you for too long. Well, that's the whole yeah. idea behind the bridge book is that it it will turn into a, another project. Yeah, yeah. but at least it's, it's connected to your, your same universe, right? So correct. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. I like that. Um, so, what do you hope that readers will um, experience as they read your book? Hope and wonder. Those are the two. Those are the, I think those are the biggest themes that I want people to to come away with um, when they read any of my books. Because, uh, you know, as we as we grow up, we, we start to lose that sense of wonder and it's sad, you know, there, and I, I, I wanted teens and adults to both experience it, uh, experience wonder again in a, in, in a new and different way. And that was co sort of the onus for bringing in familiar characters that we we all know and love from myth and legend. Um, and and putting a new twist and a, and giving them their origin story to instill that to reignite that wonder um, right. and the hope you know hope that you know good triumphs over evil that there's there is there is good in the world um, you know I guess they would consider nowadays with the there are so many different nomenclatures for uh, for books I guess you would consider uh, piercing the veil a noble bright book. I love that so much. What advice do you have for other writers who are maybe working on their first book and have been working on it for maybe a number of years and are wondering if they're going to reach the end of it? Do you have any advice for, you know, getting there and getting through? Yeah, after or actually more than as I was getting close to finishing book one um, and realizing what I had experienced in the writing process and the encouragement that I had. I developed this new passion of wanting to help young writers, new writers, uh, because I think the biggest obstacle is just getting started. Um, and what's really cool is I was approached by, uh, the, in the state of North Dakota, they have this thing called Public University or Humanities North Dakota. And they asked me to, uh, to teach a course, which is coming up this fall on speculative fic writing specul speculative fiction. And so I'm going to focus that course. And, and the advice basically is just write, get the story out of your head and get it either whether you want to write it by hand or whether you type it, just get it out of your head and into written form. Uh, that's, I think, the biggest hurdle. Uh, you know, everybody wants to worry about grammar and convention and writing, uh, you know, writing structures, save the cat, uh, this, that, you know, all that just right. You can worry yeah. about all that other stuff <laughs> later after you get that first draft out. And that's kind of, that's going to be the focus of, of the speculative fiction class that I'm, that I'm teaching this fall is, is just helping them get that first draft out and, uh, and connecting them with critique partners. That's the other advice I would give is to find a critique partner or a critique group. Cause that's helped me so much. Right. I, I struck gold when I found a, uh, uh, Daryl Percival, who his his new book is coming out this fall. I'm very excited cool. uh, for him, and he is um, he's phenomenal. He's just such a great writing partner, very encouraging, 
and um, and understands what it means to be a critique partner. He doesn't let me get away with crap. He's he's not. <laughs> he, he you know he's like, come on, Steve, you could do better than this. You know that type awesome. stuff, or That's you know funny. stuff just doesn't make any sense or whatever. Yeah, he'll let me know, and 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 we've kind of developed that that writing partnership together. Cool. You know, one day we we might kind of uh, do a collaboration, but right now we're we're focusing on our our own series. But uh, I'm looking forward to. Um, to reading his book coming out this fall called Shadow awesome. of the King. Okay, well, we'll have to check that out. That's really cool. Yeah. And what a great opportunity for you to be able to teach a class like that. Too. Yeah, it was really cool. I was so I was so surprised that because I just got an email one day from the one of the I, one of the people from Humanities North Dakota uh, to see if I'd be interested, and they let me um, attend a cl class that one of the other classes that they offer that they thought might be interesting to me. So I was able to see, kind of see the format of how they, they do things and uh, it's cool. And it's open. It's even though it's from humanities, North Dakota, it's open to anybody in the world who wants oh, to really? register and be a part, wow. yeah, be a part of it. So really yeah, cool. any, anybody can join. That's great. Well, people will have to check that out. Um, but Steve, this is um, the, kind of getting to the end of our time here. So I do want to ask you um, the favorite question of the of the show here. Um, so this is the greatest podcast in the multiverse. Can you tell me how in a parallel universe, a different decision might have shaped another version of your life? Ah, uh, Yeah, I mean, I think I, I honestly believe that if I had not met my wife or married my wife or <laughs> my wife, Karen, um, I don't think I don't think I would have gotten where I am today in in many ways, not just as a um, uh, as a writer, but also even as a principal. Uh, I, I think my my path would have definitely taken another turn. I probably would still be a teacher at this point. Uh, I'd probably be just harboring that that desire to write, but not having the encouragement to do it. Um, so I'd probably and I'd probably still be living in Florida. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's it's great to have um, someone that like a partner who supports you and supports Big your time. writing. Like that definitely is such a. I have that as well within my wife as well. She supports awesome. my writing cool. so much, and yeah, like it's um, it would be much more of a difficult process without <laughs> without that encouragement, right? Yep. Yeah, that's for you. sure. Cool. So, yeah. uh, Steve, can you tell our listeners where they can find you either on social media or your website, and where they can get a copy of your book? Sure. Well. I know my name is a little bit difficult to pronounce, Stephen Guglich. So the, I do have StephenGuglich.com, but I made it easier for people. So you can go to the Valsaga.com, and uh, that's my website. And there's links to links to the book, uh, and and you can purchase the book just about anywhere books are sold. Um, if you're local, I love to support local independent bookstores. Um, and if they don't carry it, all they need is the ISBN number and they can call uh, Ingram Spark and order it directly from uh, from them. And uh, and then you'd support your local bookstore as well as supporting independent authors. Definitely. Fantastic. Thank you again so much for joining me today. This has been really fun. I've really enjoyed this. I have too. Thank you. Yeah. It's been a pleasure and uh, best wishes on your writing as well. Thank you so much. I hope we uh, get to talk to you again soon.